Take the surface whose equation is z equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared, and let's say we want to find the volume under the surface, but above the xy plane. We can find the volume under a surface in the xy plane by taking a double integral over some region of the xy plane. Since the xy plane is the plane where z equals 0, if we set z equal to 0 in our surface equation, we find that the volume we're interested in is inside the circle of radius 3 centered at the origin, so we will need to take a double integral over this disk. Unfortunately, this is easier said than done. Since this region is not a rectangle, in order to integrate over it in x and y, we would need to describe the boundary curve as a relation between y and x. If we integrate with respect to y first, we would need to describe this circle using the two equations y equals square root of 9 minus x squared and y equals negative square root of 9 minus x squared, which would then become the bounds of our inner integral. This will work, but it's definitely going to be a pain to compute. However, there's actually a much nicer way to set up this integral if you happen to know polar coordinates. Using polar coordinates, we can describe our integration region, the disk of radius 3 centered at the origin, just using two simple inequalities. The first one says that the radius r is between 0 and 3, which captures that the disk's boundary is the circle of radius 3, and we're interested in points that are closer to the origin. The second inequality says that we're interested in covering the full 360 degree, or 2 pi radian, angular span of the disk, and not just some sector of the disk. Using these polar inequalities, we obtain much simpler integration bounds. We still can't integrate this directly yet, since we need to convert the integrand from xy coordinates to r theta, but this is actually pretty simple if you remember the formulas relating them. In particular, r relates to x and y via the Pythagorean theorem, so r squared equals x squared plus y squared. This means our integrand can be rewritten as 9 minus r squared. And there you have it. We have converted an ugly double integral in x and y into a much simpler double integral in terms of r and theta, which only has constant bounds. If you compute this integral, you'll find that the volume is 36 pi, or about 113. Nice! There's only one minor drawback. This is the wrong answer. The true volume under the surface, which we'll compute later on, is actually 81 pi over 2 or about 127. So what went wrong here? First, let's back up and make sure we're clear on how exactly we're using polar coordinates to compute the volume of the solid under the surface. To compute a double integral, we first compute the inner integral, and follow it with the outer integral. The inner integral is an integral in r, so it corresponds to sweeping out a two-dimensional slice of the solid starting from the origin, and going out along a radial line, to some point on the boundary circle. We then follow this with the outer integral in theta, which means taking this two-dimensional slice and revolving it 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians, about the z-axis, which sweeps out the rest of the solid whose volume we want. So that's conceptually what we want our double integral in r and theta to do. So why didn't our original double integral expression reflect that? The issue is actually pretty subtle. It's with the differentials dr and d theta themselves. Remember that integrals don't care about what the variables inside them are supposed to represent. They don't know that r and theta are supposed to represent a polar coordinate system, and so to them, integrating r from 0 to 3 and theta from 0 to 2 pi, instead of taking place on a disk, might as well be happening on a rectangle in a separate plane where the axes are labeled r and theta instead of x and y. The problem here is, measurements of distance and area in this r theta plane, where the double integral lives, may not correspond to measurements in the xy plane, where we are. For example, let's say we divide up this rectangle in r theta space into a bunch of little rectangles, each with the same dimensions, which we'll call dr by d theta. What do these little rectangles look like in the true xy space? Remember. Horizontal lines in r theta space represent lines that have the same common theta value, so they turn into radial lines in xy space, 
each at their corresponding theta angle value. But vertical lines in R theta space represent lines that have the same common R value, so they turn into concentric circles in XY space, each with their corresponding radius R value. So we get the following pattern in the XY plane, which looks a bit like a dartboard, and the individual little rectangles we started with turned into these curvy trapezoids. But here's the key thing to notice. These trapezoids come in different sizes. The trapezoids near the origin are quite small, but the trapezoids near the outer circle are significantly bigger. But remember that each rectangle in R theta space was the exact same size and dimensions. So by transforming out of R theta space and into XY space, we find that some dr by d theta rectangles shrank and others expanded, and our original integral in R and theta took none of this shrinking and stretching into account. So in order to get our double integral, which lives in R theta space, to compute the correct volume of a solid in XY space, we have to compensate for how the dr by d theta rectangles with low R values are bigger in R theta space than they are in XY space, and so over contribute to the volume. And also, how the dr by d theta rectangles with high R values are smaller in R theta space than they are in XY space, and so under contribute to the volume. This comes down to multiplying the area of each tiny rectangle dr by d theta in the integral by a certain scale factor in order to make the area of the original tiny rectangle match the area of the trapezoid. This scale factor is the ratio between the area of a trapezoid in xy space and the area of the original rectangle in r theta space. This will cancel out the distortion caused by transforming from r theta to xy. Note that this scale factor will be different depending on which r theta rectangle we're looking at because different rectangles are distorted by different amounts depending on where they're located. That means the scale factor itself will be a function of r and theta. This scale factor function is called the Jacobian, often represented with a capital J, and we stick it in our integral expression right next to the differentials dr and d theta. But how do we compute this scale factor? Well, it's actually computed by taking the determinant of a certain square matrix. Here's how it works. Consider the formulas that compute x and y from r and theta. In this case, those formulas are the following. x equals r cosine of theta, and y equals r sine of theta. You then take the formulas for x and y, one at a time, and compute the two partial derivatives associated with them. So dx over dr, and dx over d theta for the x formula, and dy over dr, and dy over d theta for the y formula. You then assemble these four partial derivatives into a matrix in the following way, where the rows of the matrix correspond to the output variables x and y, and the columns correspond to the input variables r and theta. What we have here is called the Jacobian matrix, and to compute the Jacobian scale factor we need, we take its determinant, which for a 2 by 2 matrix means multiplying across the two diagonals and subtracting the results. Finally, we actually need to take the absolute value of this result. This is because we only care about how the areas of our rectangles scale in magnitude, not whether the rectangles we started with got flipped in the transformation between coordinate systems. Let's apply this formula to our polar coordinate transformation and see what the Jacobian factor is. First, we take the partial derivatives of x and y with respect to both of their independent variables. The partial of x in r will just be cosine of theta, since theta is treated as a constant, and the partial of x in theta will be negative r sine of theta. Likewise, the partial of y in r is just sine of theta, and the partial of y in theta is r cosine of theta. This gives us our Jacobian matrix. To take the determinant of this matrix, we multiply first down the main diagonal, which gives us r cosine squared of theta and then subtract from this the product across the other diagonal, which is negative r sine squared of theta. This becomes r cosine squared of theta plus r sine squared of theta, 
which, if you factor out the r, becomes r times the quantity cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta. And if you remember your trig identities, you know cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. So all we're left with is r. Now, technically, we should also take its absolute value. But when using polar coordinates with integration, we almost always use only positive r values. So it's generally fine to omit the absolute value here. So there you have it. Our Jacobian scale factor is r. And if we insert it into our original volume double integral, we find it computes 81 pi over 2, which is the true volume of the solid we started with. All right, this was admittedly a lot to process, so let's summarize everything up. It's sometimes helpful to convert an integral in xy to another coordinate system, like r theta. Doing this involves finding an equivalent description of the integration region in the new coordinate system, which will give you your new integration bounds. You also need to convert the integrand expression into the new coordinate system. But finally, you need to convert the differentials dx dy into the new system, which involves swapping them out with the new differentials dr d theta, but together with a scale factor called the Jacobian, which compensates for any area mismatches between the two coordinate systems. This Jacobian scale factor is computed by taking the absolute value of the determinant of a matrix whose entries come from taking partial derivatives of your old coordinates with respect to your new coordinates. All right, one last thing. It can sometimes be a little confusing to remember where to fit the Jacobian into your integral expression and also to remember the order you take derivatives. Was it dx over dr or the other way around? To help with this, I sometimes find this alternative notation for the Jacobian helpful. If you want to convert from xy to r theta, the Jacobian can be represented by the expression dx comma y over dr comma theta. What's nice about this expression is that if you place it inside the integral expression, it almost looks like the dr comma theta on the bottom cancels with the dr d theta differentials on the outside, leaving you with the original dx dy you started with. This can be helpful because converting from dx dy to dr d theta will feel like multiplying and dividing dx dy by dr d theta. What's more, this notation suggests the order to take the partial derivatives. You have dx comma y on top and dr comma theta on bottom, so your matrix should be populated with similar looking expressions.